Welcome everyone to today's webinar by Professor Rita Cowell, joined, joined, organized jointly by the Onward Project and the Air Center. And it is my honor and privilege to introduce Professor Colwell to all of you. Indeed, Professor Colwell needs no introduction. She is a distinguished professor at the University of Maryland at College Park and Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And she is the president of Cosmos ID Inc. And in, uh, <clears throat> yes, an internationally acclaimed oceanographer and microbiologist, Professor Colwell and her team were the first to use satellite remote sensing data to develop a predictive model for cholera outbreaks in East Asia. And she is the first scientist to link global warming with potential rise in cases of infectious uh, diseases. She was the first to recognize the importance of safe drinking water. Colwell and her colleague, Dr. Anwar Haq of Bangladesh could reduce the cholera percentage by 48% by using simple cotton sari cloth as a filter for drinking water in rural Bangladesh. With years of research on Vibrio cholerae and having published around an astonishing 700 papers on cholera, Professor Colwell is at present applying genomic analysis and studying the genome evolution of Vibrio cholerae. Professor Colwell has served as chairman of many international science academies and has been honored with awards and 63 honorary degrees. A geological site in Antarctica, the Colwell Massive, has been named in recognition of her work in the polar regions. She is an inspirational figure who has been a role model for many scientists, and I count myself one of them. We are privileged to have Dr. Colwell address us today, and I hand over the podium to Professor Colwell. Thank you for, very much for agreeing to make this presentation for us, Dr. Powell. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to you all, and uh, especially globally. This is a wonderful opportunity to share experiences and um, uh, scientific discoveries over the past several years. I'm going to talk about waterborne diseases but I particularly want to point out that we are in a pandemic of COVID, but what is not recognized, uh, except of course in the countries where cholera is a problem, we are still and have been in the seventh pandemic of cholera, which began in the late 1960s. And as you can see, cholera, a waterborne disease, has been in a pandemic stage um, really since the pre-mobilized world and intertwined are other pandemics, smallpox, plague, etc. But cholera is persistent. Cholera is a water-related disease. Of course, you all know that. And I don't need to convince the audience that waterborne disease is very lethal. Just cholera alone, um, a diarrheal disease, uh, uh, including cholera, deal with about a one and a half billion cases every year and close to two million deaths. So it is a genuine human tragedy. It's a global disease, water-related disease. We're in the seventh pandemic that started in the 1960s. It occurs in about 50 countries, affects at least 7 million people. And very unfairly, we have ascribed the Bengal Delta as the native homeland of cholera outbreaks. However, 
until 100 years ago, 120 or 30 years ago, when chlorination of drinking water in the US and in Europe was instituted, cholera was in fact a major problem in the Western countries as well. Cholera exists in the aquatic environment. This is the discovery that um, my students and I made some years ago. And the evidence of new biotypes makes it clear that cholera cannot be eradicated but it definitely can be controlled very effectively by providing safe drink water, drinking water. And cholera becomes a, a sort of a poster child for water-related infectious diseases, which is of course one of the reasons that I have spent my entire career working on this disease because it can be controlled by providing safe drinking water. Again, Many of you are very familiar with the bacterium shown in a scanning electron micrograph, a single flagellum, flagellum or a tail that provides motility, easily cultured on a medium thiosulfate uh, um, 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 uh, agar, which uh, has a carbohydrate which is utilized by the bacterium hence the yellow colonies. But it is a devastating disease with severe loss of fluid and dehydration and death, if not rehydration provided effectively. I, I started my work really as a graduate student at the University of Washington in Seattle, and then did a postdoc with Dr. Um, Gibbons, who was a halophile specialist in the National Research Council of Canada, and then moved to Georgetown University about 45 years ago, um, or actually more, 50 years ago, and started working in Chesapeake Bay following the discoveries made as a graduate student on the fact that Vibrios were the dominant bacteria easily cultured from the aquatic system in salt water, uh, brackish water and fresh water. And in Chesapeake Bay, we found each of those numbers are sampling stations that we routinely sample even today, most of those stations for microorganisms. The discovery we made was the presence of Vibrio cholerae in Chesapeake Bay and associated with copepods, planktonic animals that are the major uh, component of the zooplankton in the world oceans. The bacteria are commensal, perhaps even symbiotic with the copepod. Um, here is the copepod uh, scanning electron micrograph. It's a gravid female. To the left, you see the egg case, which is covered uh, coated with the bacteria. The vibrios produce a powerful enzyme, chitinase. It breaks down the N-acetylglucosamine polymer that comprises the hard white shell of shellfish, uh, crabs, shrimp, etc. And it also produces a powerful proteolytic enzyme which ruptures the egg case. And the copepod casts its eggs into the water column. And we hypothesize that the coating of the egg case and the expression of the enzyme ruptures the egg case. And hence, it is perhaps a commental or symbiotic interaction with the copepod as, as it matures. The model we developed way back in the early 1970s was very simplistic, mainly that in the spring months um, with increased sunlight, the phytoplankton, the algae bloom. That is followed by the bloom or the ascendancy of the zooplankton which feed on the phytoplankton. And then <clears throat> as the zooplankton um, population 
declines or crashes, it releases the vibrios into the water column. And these um, spring and fall blooms correlate very strongly with the epidemics that occur in Bangladesh, Calcutta, um, Southeast Asia um, in the spring and fall. And that was <clears throat> the first uh, correlation of the relationship of a seasonality with the uh, plankton bacteria correlation. Now, we were criticized that this was just a phenomenon that occurred in Chesapeake Bay. And the challenge was whether this really held in Bangladesh. So in 1975, my students and I took up the challenge and began about 35 years of research in Bangladesh with our colleagues there and subsequently graduate students who joined my laboratory, postdocs, et cetera, a very productive collaboration. And obviously taking water directly from the ponds really indicates that the exposure is to the unsafe drinking water. And the model for cholera source that we had developed in the Chesapeake Bay held in Bangladesh. Now, obviously, person-to-person -person transmission is paramount once the disease is entrenched. However, the source is the environment, and the bacterium is a naturally occurring microorganism that functions in the carbon and nitrogen cycling uh, of the aquatic ecosystem. Now, it became important for us to understand how to predict, because if we can predict, and if we can intervene, we can prevent substantial numbers of illnesses and death. If we wait until the peak uh, of the outbreak, by that time, it's really too late because uh, you're not able to intervene sufficiently early. So it behooved us to develop a mechanism for determining prediction of cholera. <clears throat> and it turned out that in 1985 or thereabouts, Landsat, a satellite was launched by NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration of the US. It was able to measure chlorophyll, chlorophyll A, B, and C. It was able to measure sea surface temperature and sea surface height. The, the sensors were able to pick up these parameters. And since we had shown that chlorophyll, the phytoplankton, were the first indicator that they, those populations became abundant, followed three or four weeks later by the zooplankton bloom, we could calculate that relationship. And we published this 20 years ago, 22 years ago now. And you can see that the sea surface temperature is the blue line. And the red line are the cholera cases in the Bay of Bengal. And the measurement of sea surface temperature, chlorophyll, sea surface height, we took a one mile quadrant off the coast of the Sunderbans in Bangladesh. This was 1990, 1995. <clears throat> and we published our results in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the year 2000, 22 years ago. And now in the intervening time, many individuals have done excellent work showing that there is a variety of factors associated with the uh, outbreaks of cholera, rainfall, flooding, the height of rivers or the low depths of a river, sea surface temperature, salinity, dissolved organic mater uh, material, uh, and of course, uh, chlorophyll. And interestingly, we found an inverse correlation with fecal contamination, and that has held up. Now, we did further extensive studies improving the model 
And we were able to show that cholera epidemics appear in different types of um, form. An epidemic cholera, for example, far from the Bay of Bengal, Chatak in Bangladesh, will have one major outbreak uh, associated with some event, such as a rel religious festival where a large number of people gather and then there's flooding from heavy rainfall. And then there's the mixed mode cholera where in Dhaka and Matlab, there are two peaks of cholera, spring and fall. And it's related to the seawater intrusion. And the second peak is related to the <clears throat> flooding that occurs with the monsoons, and that's the fall peak. And then there's endemic cholera, which occurs constantly throughout the year. So this we have been able to develop by studying historical records in India from 1823 to about 1923 or 25. And we <clears throat> superimpose this on the studies currently, and we were able to develop this pattern. We've, we've improved the ability to study epidemic cholera extensively because now <clears throat> we use a variety of other uh, parameters as well as just sea surface temperature, chlorophyll, and so forth. We can include a variety of parameters. <clears throat> Furthermore, we were able to use many new satellites. We started with um, Landsat. This was 1995 when we started the work <clears throat> using satellite imagery. And then we um, used other satellites as they were launched with their sensors that became more and more infect, uh, uh, effective for our analyses to the present where now we're able to measure the temperature and chlorophyll in one square meter of water with these declassified uh, uh, satellites that were developed for the military and now are available for um, um, public use. And so we now can measure the, the chlorophyll, the temperature of ponds and not have to extrapolate from a one mile quadrant off the coast of the Bay of Bengal. So the question is how effective could our predictive model be? We did a retrospective analysis of the cholera in Haiti. And the 2010 outbreak occurred at the time of a massive earthquake that was devastating uh, to Haiti. It occurred in January. And in late that, that year, around October and November, the cholera epidemic, which was serious and tragic occurred. What we discovered was that when we went back to the data available from NASA and from other data banks, 2010 was the hottest year in 50 years. Um, the red line shows the average temperature in 2010 and the average of the previous 50 years. Similarly, in late August, September, a massive 50 year major rainfall occurred following the hurricane that traversed around Haiti. So all of the factors that concatenated with the earthquake having uh, destroyed what was left uh, of a rather primitive, but had been functional sanitation system, this combination was really uh, such that the outbreak could have been predicted. We um, then did uh, another analysis since that um, 2010 was um, 
fascinating as a retrospective study, Hurricane Matthew traversed Haiti, uh, was very damaging again, this was 2015, and came up across the east coast of the United States. So we did again a, an analysis and our prediction can be shown here as the hotspot of highly predicted cholera. These are the actual cases in 2015. We then did another a prediction for Haiti in 2017. We predicted that Haiti, I'm sorry, for Yemen. We predicted that for Yemen, cholera would be very serious, uh, very high risk, uh, in this part of the country. And in fact, in 2017, uh, that's where the cholera outbreaks occurred. Now we published this um, in a scientific journal. It was picked up by Scientific American, which is <clears throat> more or less a layman uh, science uh, magazine. And uh, that, uh, it was just a paragraph in science um, magazine. And one of our colleagues in England happened to see it. And he worked for the British Aid Agency. And he, ran, he called us on the telephone in January of 2018 and said, look, could we work together? You provide the Yemen predictive maps on a monthly basis <clears throat> and we will locate water supplies, physicians, medical supplies, where you indicate the highest risk. And we did that, we worked together and the incidence of cholera was significantly reduced in 2018. Now it's not clear we can take credit for all of the reduction, but nevertheless, uh, we have continued to provide the prediction for Yemen and we now work with the UN agencies, UNICEF, British Aid Agency, the uh, British Meteorological Agency, and of course, funded by NASA for the satellite work. So <clears throat> we now have a very effective predictive uh, capacity for <clears throat> cholera, and uh, we've expanded to Ethiopia and we've made some predictions for Sudan as well. In fact, that was quite a surprise. Um, uh, we've, we were doing the study on a larger basis around Yemen as well as Yemen. Yemen and we picked up this high risk point and, um, and notified the agencies and uh, it turned out to be uh, true. In other words, cholera did break out. I'm gonna switch now to from the satellite high distance to the microscopic and the ultra microscopic because it ties together and you'll see uh, in a moment as I develop the, <clears throat> the argument. In 2007, I developed an algorithm to um, along with many others who were doing something similar. <clears throat> but what I did was to, do, to develop an algorithm for extracting DNA sequencing it, running it through um, uh, any sequencer, it's agnostic, the algorithm, agnostic with respect to ion torrent or Illumina or whatever. And then we built a massive database and the sequence reads are matched, which gives us uh, identification of bacteria, viruses, fungus, and parasites, protists. Furthermore, we also have a da database allowing us to identify the presence of genes coding for antibiotic resistance and for pathogenicity properties like toxin production, um, uh, uh, various other types of uh, um, um, pathogenic properties uh, in the bacteria. And that gives us entire character characterization and identification of the microorganisms and characterization of them. And this allows us to identify right down to strain. 
strain is really important. And I know many of you who are microbiologists can understand that fully well. Uh, here's one example of a study we did, um, which I need to publish, uh, in Calcutta with the National Institute of Cholera and Enteric Diseases, a wonderful collaboration. And I am very grateful to the team there, and I promise them I will get this published. They provided us um, <clears throat> with their surveillance data, the DNA extracted from the stool of patients. They did the, um, the analyses of <clears throat> the bacteria, viruses, and parasites using standard laboratory tests. We then received the DNA <clears throat> on um, uh, DNA blinded. So we were just told that here are samples of uh, known etiology, um, and then in subsequent uh, sets of samples. First set was nine samples of DNA extracted, then 28 samples, and then 37. And it's a combination of where they could identify what was present, um, Vibrio cholerae and anything else. Um, samples, they couldn't identify the presence of um, Vibrio cholerae, even though it the patients had all the symptoms of cholera. And then some of the um, volunteers uh, who were healthy uh, provided samples for us to analyze. This turned out to be fascinating because with a known disease etiology where they could identify Vibrio cholerae for the cholera patients coming in, we identified Vibrio cholerae, but also in the uh, pink area, other pathogens sometimes some salmonella, sometimes some shigella, sometimes uh, um, campylobacter, et cetera. Where they could not identify the presence of vibrios, we found that it was predominantly pathogenic forms of E. coli uh, that were predominant in those patients with the diarrheal disease that mimicked cholera. But interestingly, we found that the healthy individuals carried much higher numbers of pathogens, but they were healthy. But they also carried much larger, a large number of these organisms, which we labeled in blue, which are the probiotic bacteria, um, the ones that you would find in yogurt and in fermented milk, which is, of course, part of the daily diet in India. We downloaded from the NIH database, the Western, if you will, um, uh, gut flora, and we found that we carry very, very few, the normal, healthy, a few pathogens, but we've known that. We know that individuals may be carriers but not have any symptoms, but we also carry much less of the probiotic because it's not a daily fare in the Western populations. We, we went on to look at, um, to test this capacity, and we studied Crohn's disease healthy and Crohn's disease, the uh, gut, gut uh, disease problem, males and females. And we found that we could see very distinct differences of bacteria that are present in Crohn's, uh, in Crohn's versus the healthy individuals. And this composite allows us to characterize as a predictive capacity for Crohn's. We have also done a massive study, which is ongoing, uh, in collaboration with Dr. Alessio Fasano at Harvard Medical School and Mass Massachusetts General Hospital and our laboratory at Maryland, where they have um, about more than, by now it's more like five or 600 uh, infants recruited uh, for the study in the United States and in Italy. It's an ongoing study. It's now in about the fourth or fifth year and um, the parents uh, have their genome sequenced for the presence of genes no, known to code for celiac disease. And the um, uh, babies are also their genomes sequenced to determine if they carry the genes passed to them from the parents. And so we have those without the genes, with the genes, in addition, um, 
we also know for those that carry the genes, whether they were delivered by cesarean or vaginal delivery, whether they're formula fed or breast milk fed, whether they had been exposed to antibiotics because of infection or whether or not. So this is a, an extraordinary study, which allows us then to be able to determine in the case of controls, very different from the cases of the celiac disease in terms of the kinds of bacteria. And we find that clostridia are more present, more likely to be present um, in the celiac disease. And the ruminococcus are more likely to be dominant in the healthy. So these are ongoing studies. I'm going now to switch to, to uh, COVID. Uh, it's not exactly a waterborne disease, but you'll see in a moment why water analysis is critical. This disease we all know by now, two years into this horrible pandemic, that it affects the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, and the intestines. What's fascinating is that um, our, we, we tested right away to see whether our identification system worked for the variants. Well, at that time, we started in um, March and April of 2020, two years ago. And that was when there was no vaccine. And uh, we wanted to make sure we could detect the SARS virus and we could easily by the um, analysis that we were doing. We've just submitted a paper uh, showing the correlation of other microorganisms, viruses, bact other bacteria, fungi, when SARS is present. So that paper has just been submitted for publication. But very early on, others showed quickly that at least half of, of um, uh, COVID patients will shed um, these are the patients will shed the um, virus in the stool. And, and this is a, looks like complicated slide, but it's not. It's very simple. These are patients, uh, one, two, three, four, five, down to 41. And then reading across uh, indicates the time scale of when their throat swab was positive. That's red. And then the orange is the fecal sample is positive for the virus. Notice that long after the throat swab is negative, the fecal sample continues to shed the virus. What we have been doing for the last almost two years is a big study for the state of Maryland through the governor's office, analyzing waste water for the virus and for other microorganisms. Because I, I feel very strongly waste water will be the predictive public health tool for disease in communities and will continue into the future. Now, this is not a new thing for me to say or because 50 years ago, wastewater was analyzed for polio virus to de determine the presence in the community. <clears throat> but it hasn't been used as it, I think it should be. But of course, now we have this tool to be able to determine the presence. This is a study from Frederick, Maryland, one of the sites. And we started the analysis in June of 2020. That was two years ago, almost two years ago. And we were able to pick up the virus as it was appearing in the population with a sudden peak in July. Now the blue are the end target genes recommended by um, CDC, but we also added the ORF uh, 1AB target genes to confirm because this was early on and there was question whether this was even effective or successful. And clearly we were able to show this peak. Interestingly, it was before the actual appearance of cases in Frederick, Maryland. And so this correlation uh, turned out to be very powerful. Um, we did a study for um, and continue to do analysis for Mount St. Mary's University, where we analyze the wastewater from individual dormitories. And one of the dormitories 
um, during the sampling that was done every, that we do every two weeks, we picked up a spike and all of the students in that dormitory were tested. 10 proved to be positive, but nine of them were asymptomatic. There was just one individual that had any symptoms whatsoever. And so they were able to quarantine those individuals and it prevented having to shut down the university at that time. Um, and so the other interesting thing we did was to take the model we had developed for cholera, which is a bacterium, for this virus. What we have done was to take into account uh, a variety of socio-demographical indicators, density of populations, um, um, age groupings, housing, wastewater analysis that done, and using satellites with the key factors being humidity and dew point temperatures and the air temperature, because if people are moving indoors when it's very, very hot for air conditioning, that's a factor. Or going outdoors um, in the temperate climates, um, that is a reducting, reduct, reducing factor. So all of these were taken into account and we developed a risk map for COVID based on the cholera risk map. And we did this early in 2020. We did this in April, May, 2020. And this was at that time, roughly about 50% accurate. Um, but you can see how well it really fits uh, for the actual cases on a county county by basis. We have improved the model so that it is now close to 80% accurate. And we can provide a risk map uh, this is the risk map for the United States on a county basis as of a few days ago, March 2022. And um, the accuracy has proven to be um, pretty powerful. Um, we now are able to um, match up the risk with the actual cases to improve the, the accuracy. Um, let me just go back for a minute and point out that um, um, this then is another indication of how we can take the studies that we have developed and, and carried out with a waterborne disease and can extrapolate to a variety of other diseases. And um, we provide now, this is done in collaboration with Dr. Anta Jutla, uh, Antipreet Jutla, uh, a wonderful, very bright, brilliant uh, postdoc who is now a tenured associate professor in the College of Engineering at the University of Florida. And we continue to collaborate. And um, on, on a website, we provide um, a, um, a weekly, I think it's uh, every, every two weeks, we can provide the risk map um, for COVID for the United States. I'm going to close um, with the work we did and was mentioned uh, by uh, my good friend Nandini Fennan about the filtration, because I want to point out that we need to keep, keep into our minds the necessity to be able to provide simple solutions based on science. I told you in the beginning of my talk, we demonstrated that Vibrio cholerae is associated with plankton. Plankton are essentially the elephant, if you will, of the microscopic world. They're about 250, 300 micrometers. The bacterium is, of course, less than one or maybe one and a half me micrometers, but attached to particulate matter, attached to copepods and part of the copepod um, microflora, if you can remove the copepods, you can remove the plankton. So we worked in the laboratory testing this hypothesis out. 
we tried a variety of cloth that would be available very inexpensively in Bangladesh. We tried men's t-shirt material that didn't work very well. We tried Chinese poplin, which is more expensive, but we thought maybe it might be more effective. It wasn't. It turned out that used sari cloth folded about eight times was very effective. It removed 99% of the cholera bacteria, but it was very slow. And we figured that women who needed to get water for their family wanted a reasonable time to do that. And we found that if it was folded at least four times, it gave about a 20 micrometer mesh filter. And that would be enough to trap the copepods. We also knew from work that had been done 50 years ago, showing that Vibrio cholerae is a dose dependent disease. You need about a million cells per milliliter, per teaspoon, if you will, of water to become really ill. If you ingest a few cells, you might have one uh, diarrheal movement, you might vomit, but you won't be seriously ill. So we knew that if we could remove 99% uh, of the bacteria from the water, we should be able to reduce the incidence of cholera in the villages in Bangladesh. So we also used another technique. Just as we in the United States have extension agents who go out for advising farmers mainly how to do good farming practices, we engaged women to be extension agents to go out to the villages and explain how to fold the sari cloth, cover the kaloshes, and then after, and to collect the water by using this simple filter, and then be sure to rinse the filter afterwards and hang it to dry in the sunlight because the sunlight acts as a disinfectant, um, the UV rays of the sunlight. And so with this approach, we were able clearly to demonstrate to the women that when it's been filtered, you don't have things swimming in the water that can be detrimental to your children. And so it was not hard to convince them to do the filtration. We were able to reduce uh, using sari cloth um, filtration by about almost 50%. It was interesting. We were uh, challenged as to whether this would be um, sustainable. So five years later, we went back to those villages, both the control villages that we had not trained to filter and the, the villages where they were filtering. <laughs> but we found that the villages that were not trained to filter discovered, learned that filtration was good. And so they were all filtering. However, we did discover a new phenomenon and that is if you were in a household that for some reason did not filter, but surrounded by those who did filter, you were protected. This is of course the herd, H-E-R-D, the herd effect. So I will close by saying that safe water is a global challenge and it is really necessary for all of us to work to make safe water available to all populations, because that will reduce disease, not just cholera. We had evidence from the work in Calcutta that we were able to remove um, E. coli and some other bacteria, but because we hadn't designed the study specifically for Vibrio cholera, we had designed it specifically for Vibrio cholera, we could not really conclude that we had reduced the other enteric infection. But my sense is that uh, the, the crude evidence indicates that if we go back and do another an, uh, study, we will find that we can, by a better filtration, we can provide safe water to the remote villages in Bangladesh. Uh, many collaborators uh, from the International Center of Diarrheal Diseases Research in Dhaka 
I especially want to thank Dr. Munir Alam, a real hero in my view, and um, the late Dr. Imdad al-Haq and Siraj al-Islam. And in Calcutta, Dr. Balakrishnair, um, whom I claim is one of my students, he's a wonderful fellow, and Dr. Rama Murthy, who collaborated beautifully with us from Calcutta. And then many students, my current student is Kyle Brumfield, but many others, uh, Jim Caper, um, just many of them, and collaborators from other countries and from other universities uh, in the United States and uh, uh, other countries. I like the words of John Muir. He was the founder of the Sierra Club, a very um, large uh, international environmental club, who said when one tugs at a single thing in nature, he, and I have been inserted, and she, they find it hitched to the rest of the universe. So I thank you very much. I've written uh, all about the cholera in my book, A Lab of One's Own, which I published two years ago. Simon and Schuster published it. And um, I look forward to your questions and I thank you for the invitation to speak. And uh, I'm delighted uh, to have had this opportunity. Uh, Professor Colwell, thank you very much for that wonderful and inspirational talk, uh, very pertinent to the problems of the day. I understand that many of your old colleagues and friends are attending the lecture today. And I have, I have a request in particular from Shanta Achutenputi from NIU Goa to convey her warm regards to you and uh, thank you for your wonderful work. Oh, so, thank you, Shanta. <laughs> Good thank you very much. We are uh, absolutely delighted that you were able to uh, address us today. So I give it to you for the questions. Yeah. Now Na Nandini will handle the question and answer session. Thank you. So we have one question that has come up. Uh, in fact, it's uh, in two sections. It's in the Q&A box that is by Julius Barsi. He has asked, uh, is the algorithm employed for SARS-CoV compatible with third generation nanopore sequencing? Oh, yes. Uh, yes, we have started using nanopore uh, sequencing and we've written um, some improved algorithms to, to make it more accurate. As you know, the nanopore tends to have um, less accuracy than obviously um, Illumina or some of the other sequencers, but we've been able to, um, through some good bioinformatics, improve the accuracy, and we have done and published some papers using the Nanopore uh, device. Thank you. And he has a second part to the same question. Have you been able to attribute regional COVID-related mortality to any particular pathogenic profile in the water that accompanies SARS-CoV-2? That's a very good question, and uh, give me about a couple of months and I can answer it because we have that study underway right now, where we, uh, we've submitted a paper that is preliminary uh, evidence that in fact, uh, indeed, there are other pathogens that we pick up. We're particularly interested to be able to pick up the influenza virus because there is the prediction or the expectation that as the COVID wanes, the influenza will begin to ascend. And we want to know if we can detect this. Uh, and that's what we're in the process of doing. So that's a very good question, very prescient. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, any more questions from participants? There are many messages thanking you for this uh, wonderful presentation, but I don't see many more questions. Yeah, so this one from India. Yeah, one has another question has come from Somnath Pai. 
in your opinion, what is the direction of research, direction for research and policy vis-a-vis -vis cholera? Uh, uh, I think if I understand the question, I feel very strongly that we can use um, wastewater analyses to uh, predict the health of a community and that this can be done on a regular basis and with sequencing techniques becoming less and less expensive uh, and with devices like the Nanopore uh, allowing um, field studies to be done, that this is one way to, to be able to do a preemptive analysis of the health of a community and to be able to um, stave uh, or, or prevent massive epidemics by knowing that um, uh, infectious agents are beginning to appear in the wastewater systems. Uh, and I think uh, this will be adopted. I, I feel strongly in the future, we will find this to be a regular public health tool. I'm not sure I answered the question. Um, um, I, I, there's a comment in that I, I'd like to respond to about uh, this being a very human centric. Um, um, yes, there is a population problem, but I'm afraid that that has to be dealt by other social scientists and politicians. And I must say that, yes, I, I agree. This is a serious problem. Thank you. And we have another question from Louis Fernandez. There was a relation with cholera and poppy pods. Is there one with COVID and poppy pods? Is there one? With COVID and poppy pods. Can we? COVID. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I don't think there is there a COVID. Um, um, poppy pod link. link. Link, I don't think so. Um, what we are working on now is the airborne transmission and droplets. Uh, my hypothesis is that um, um, the micro droplets that have been shown to carry the virus travels much longer than we think. Um, right now, uh, the medical community at first disputed airborne transmission. Then it uh, finally admitted that six feet uh, transmission, then uh, 26 feet, but I think it transfers much, much longer distances. And we're in the process of testing that right now, which will be very interesting. Yeah, we have another question now from Nuket Sivri. Thank you for your gorgeous presentation. Do you have any thoughts on the rare elements like gadolinium and germanium that will affect the bacteria, algae, or copepods mechanisms? Do I have, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the connection with what? Uh, any connection between rare elements? Rare elements that will affect the bacteria or uh, algae or the copepods. You mean like uh, like uh, ions, can't calcium or? I think even rarer than that. Uh, yeah. They're talking about uh, germanium and oh. Oh, gadolinium. Um, I'm afraid I don't have any evidence and, and can't answer that question. I, I'm sort of curious as to why one would suspect it. Um, unless there was an incorporation um, from some of the um, elements in the structure of the copepod, but I, I have no evidence. <laughs> I, I, I have no data. I cannot speak from without data. Talking of data, Professor Caldwell, do you find it difficult to find the right clinical data for some of the work that you have been able to accomplish? Indeed, indeed, um, that, uh, that is changing. We're now in an era, as we all know, of big data and um, the ability to uh, call through massive amounts of data with uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. 
And that's now being applied and, and we're doing some of that as well. In fact, we're about to launch a study with um, a, um, a university um, a dental school and um, also a medical school to correlate uh, symptoms in patients with uh, and, and various uh, symptoms um, with uh, the disease and with the types of bacteria. Because as we do our refined study on the community composition, the microbiome, we find strong correlation with intensity of symptoms and with diseases. For example, I'm finding it amazing that tumors have a characteristic microbiome. Some I studies see. are being done by Rob Knight and his team in California and by a team in Europe. Fascinating. So um, we indeed are 80 or 90% microorganisms, even though our human cells are bigger. Um, and so some have proposed that microorganisms are yet another organ of the human body. And so I think um, as we parse these combinations of microorganisms and their metabolic capacity, that's another thing I didn't have time to talk about, but we're also determining what this community of microorganisms do, knowing that certain ones carry out certain pathways and others other pathways, but together, how does that complexity comprise a situation amenable to disease or maintaining health? So there's a lot to be learned. Thank you very much. Uh, I just check one last time if there are further questions. I don't see any. And we have retained you for a long time. So let me once again, uh, thank you very much, Professor Colwell. And uh, thank you for all those who have attended and benefited from this presentation. I might add that uh, this is now part of a series of um, lectures being organized as a training course. So I'm sure that the participants of the training course have also been very grateful to you for this uh, presentation. Thank you very much for taking the time. We appreciate it. Thank and you for the invitation. It's been wonderful. And I'm just scanning the many countries that participate and it's terrific, absolutely terrific. It is indeed. Uh, uh, this Onward project, we had to, um, on the spur of the moment, more or less, changed our entire work plan when COVID hit. Yes. And of course, there are many downsides to it, but this kind of a wonderful opportunities, I think are the beneficiaries, are the benefits that uh, unexpectedly came our way. So thank you very much. Indeed. Cheerio. Milton. Cheerio. Milton, would you like to say anything? Um. Just to thank again, Dr. Cowell for her generosity, sharing her time, knowledge, intelligence with us today, very inspiring, especially for the younger participants. And uh, I'd also to thank the Air Center for the collaboration, for hosting this webinar, and uh, to the colleagues of the Unknown Mark Network for the nice work, and also to announce that we are planning a next webinar very soon, so keep in touch. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Yes. Thank you very much, all at Air Center. Thank you all. And we wish you goodbye. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs>